Welcome to the Spencer Lodge podcast in partnership with Vault Hill, Arabian Business and Najahi Events. When you talk to serial entrepreneurs, you want to find stories of stuff they've done that have been inspiring, but also funny with lots of energy. And today's guest, Mark Verge, is exactly that kind of guy. I think that anybody that wants to be successful in business needs to bring a certain amount of energy and passion to whatever they do. And that is exactly what Mark does. He's an entrepreneur, he's an investor, He's created many of today's most popular and successful destinations and businesses today that are found throughout LA. His business compromises of restaurants, bars, hotels, environmental companies, real estate companies, and fashion companies. I mean, goodness me, he's got his fingers in many, many pies. He founded Perfect Business, a resource center and network of entrepreneurs, investors, and business experts to share knowledge and support of aspiring entrepreneurs. He's got bundles of energy, he's really enthusiastic, and is a really funny guy. And I know you're going to enjoy this episode. So let's cue the music and get stuck in to Mark Verge. Vault Hill is the world's first human-centric metaverse that's opened its doors for brands and entities to launch their presence in the metaverse in only 48 hours. This is the fastest activation ever and the first time ever any metaverse has offered this. Upon this activation process, brands will receive free virtual land in Vault Hill City and can give life to their metaverse presence by buying buildings in the Vault Hill marketplace and deploy it on their dedicated V land. Then brands can customize their land using unbounded creativity, they can display their own NFTs or upload different media, logos or digital creations to start to capitalize from their digital assets. Go check out vaulthill.io. And lastly, thank you to Najahi Events, who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Mark, thank you for coming to join us on the podcast today. What an honor. I'm fired up. Being introduced to you by Ken uh, is, well, whenever, whoever Ken introduces me to it ends up being a great connection to have. So I'm really looking forward to chatting to you today and learning a bit about your story and maybe some shared beliefs that we might have. <laughs> For sure. A lot of shared beliefs already. You're a, you're a kind of like what we call serial entrepreneur, a guy that's been been in business for many years you've not really been an employee of anywhere you've been out there doing your own thing for a long time now but a lot of people don't know how to get into the you know the whole world of being a businessman you know when I'm, I'm 52 it wasn't called entrepreneur when I was young it was called businessman you know or started a business or sole trader or one-man band there was nothing more than that to it but it was over it was very overwhelming because of the fear of walking away from a salary you know, my salary would make sure that I was safe. I could pay my mortgage and I could pay my car payments and I was good. Why would you take the risk to be an entrepreneur? So tell me about your journey and how you got into it. So I was fortunate to have a dad who was a teacher. So my dad, we had six kids in the family and he was a teacher and he always believed that everyone should be a teacher. So it was great. You heard I'm the fifth out of six, which to me always defines who you are, where you fit into your family structure, because when you're fifth out of six, they, my name's Mark, but they pretty much call you Mike because they've forgotten about you. <laughs> but it, it drove me because I was in Santa Monica where there was an extreme amount of wealth and we went to a Catholic school and it seemed like everyone had money but me. And so everything revolved to me about at one point I got to make money. So everyone wanted to get these jobs as a police officer, a fireman, or they're going to be a Hollywood star. We went to school with a lot of kids who were famous. And so, but this Catholic school our family helped start was there. And we just said, you know, everyone's going to do this. You're going to be, you know, a fireman because the rest of the kids are movie stars. Tom Selleck's son went there. Or, you know, Marlon Brando's daughter went there. And, you know, they're on their path. But for me, it always felt like I didn't have enough money. So we got into horse racing where we were going out to the racetrack, seeing extreme wealth. And we loved horse racing. So we decided we're just gonna learn all about business and how these guys make money. So I was fascinated with money, not with the rock star, cause you know, I knew people like that, or not with the movie star, I knew people like that. I wanna know how guys made money. So everyone I met, I was fascinated by how they earned money. And I found out it was all hustle. It was never working for somebody, ever. It was on your own, 
how am I going to over deliver for anything I do? And I started getting into selling gold coins. And I knew if I undercut everybody and gave my customer the best deal possible, I can make money, not a lot, but the overwhelming, you know, coming back, coming back, coming back and getting that customer was amazing. So I just loved to me was make, I had these goals of making money because everyone around me, I thought was much wealthier. Later on, I find out that there were poor kids at school. They just happened to have very nice clothes. <laughs> LA. So th that, that makes me think then that the word hustle must be associated to being able to sell as well. Being so, a seller. You're, we're all in sales. I teach a lot of business school class and I open up with the same thing every time. Like who wants to be in sales? And one, maybe in the maybe in the back of the room, maybe one hand goes up. And then I said, who doesn't want to be in sales? Every hand goes up. I said, so you're going to leave Marshall Business School. And somehow you're going to walk into Google and not say a word because you have this great USC degree. I said, you're wrong. We're all in sales, no matter what. It, it's everything you do, you're in sales. No matter what you think, every, everything you do to be successful as in sales. So when you think about that time of selling those gold coins, who taught you how to do that? Was there somebody that, that took you under their wing and somebody that kind of mentored you at that time? Yeah, I, I had a few. I was very fortunate to be collecting millionaires at the time. Now I call it collecting billionaires, but it used to be collecting millionaires where people would allow me into their network, kind of like Ken. Uh -huh. You were allowed to meet people who were successful because they knew I'd never rip them off. And it was just... They, once you got in there, you never burned that bridge. It was really important to me, you know, that your reputation was everything. And so you'd over deliver. And, and the, the price that I could get for anything, I would beat, even if it meant sometimes just breaking even. So you, were, you essentially were trying to find the connection and whatever transaction that could be done, that was the deal that you were going to offer. No matter what. No matter what. And I, it, it just as long as, as, long as you turned turn the cash over and turn. you had the cash flow. And you could buy. I mean, there were so many times where I'm buying collections for $240,000 running. And the check was not good. Hold this check for two days. And they'd look at you and say, okay, because they trusted me. I'd run out and sell for $247,000, make $7,000, get the money back in the account. And I knew my bank account better than I knew my name. How alive did you feel when you were doing that? That's a great question. Um... I'm not a big look back guy. I think there was such a drive to make money. I don't know if there was a, a live. I think it was just more like, I got to make money. I just, I was insane. I was insane. When but, I but was it fun? Mm, I don't know if it was fun. Oh. I'm not that, I'm not the nostalgic guy. Like, oh, I miss those. I don't, I don't miss it. I, I love today. I don't look back and what do they say? The past is for cowards. I just don't look back ever. And like, I'm just not nostalgic. I don't know why. Maybe I just have issues with that. But I'm not one of these guys. Oh, I missed high school. I don't. <laughs> it was great. And I like seeing the guys and we hang out. I'm, I stay in touch with all my buddies from grade school, high school. I know what they're all doing. But there was nothing worse than sitting in that classroom, listening to some lady tell you about, you know, religion or math. You're like, I'm with that. What are we learning? Like, are you being serious right now? I want to know how to make money. I want to know how that kid had a Jeep and I didn't. <laughs> Do you remember the first deal that you did? Ooh, that's a knock. Look at you. you. You're good at this. My first deal, the first money-making thing was probably just selling, you know, door-to-door -door avocados and the market avocados that weren't our avocados. You'd go around and pick all the avocados off all the neighbors' places and you'd go sell it everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they weren't. My first deal was stolen avocados. Yeah, you'd have a picker and, you know, everyone had avocado trees in Santa Monica. So you'd pick them and then you'd go sell them for three for a dollar and people would buy them like crazy. Did you sell them to the people who you, you, you sell yeah, them? No, you just, they didn't really <laughs> seem to care. There's avocado trees in everyone's backyard. And you just pick them. I remember, I mean, my, my first direct sales job was selling office equipment. And we used to sell um, fax machines and photocopiers. So this was back in 1988, maybe. And I remember the first deal I did. Okay, and I remember the lady really clearly because most people would buy these machines um, on finance. They wouldn't buy them cash. But I went to this in the city. I went to this insurance company and the lady said, Let, yeah, bring the machine in. Let's have a look at it. So I left it there for a couple of days. And then she said, yeah, do you want to come and collect the check? And I was like, the check? You know, we've got to do some application forms for your finance. She goes, no, we'll just buy it cash. Anyway, so I go in there, get an order form filled in and she gives me a check. I don't know what it was for, £3,000 or something. I can't remember exactly. And... I was over the moon, I'd done this deal. 
But while I was doing the deal, she said to me, would you like to go for dinner one evening? Now, bear in mind, I was a kid. I was like in my late teens. And this woman was just, it didn't matter. I didn't know how much older she was. She was just older, but old, old enough not to be my type. Oh my God. And I'd never been in that position. And so I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I'd like to go for dinner. And um, she said, okay, great. So let's go for dinner the next Tuesday, whatever the date was. And I'm um, thinking that, oh, where am I going to get the money to buy this woman dinner? You know, she's a customer. What's the process? How do I do it? I go back, I speak to my boss and my boss is like, yeah, you've got to go for dinner for goodness sake. Absolutely. Cement the relationship, you know, build it. <laughs> you, know, you don't know who she knows. You don't know who you connect with. And I'm like, okay, okay. So she said, so she said oh, I'll book the table. I'm like, okay, fine, no problem at all. And then the day of it, okay, I, I got a fax from her saying, hey, um, I didn't book a table. I've decided I'll cook you dinner. Oh my gosh. And so I then have to go to her house for dinner. Now her house was in Islington, which is the other side of the city. And I have to go to this house and I go to this basement flat with this lady, um, older lady, don't think she's hot. She wasn't hot, okay, <laughs> definitely not from me at 18. And I go to her house and she cooks me dinner and I'm totally uncomfortable. I don't know what to do. I don't know. I'm de really, did I go in a suit? Did I go in my casual clothes? I wore a suit to work. How did I do it? What did I do? You know, what do I take? You know, do I take wine? Do I take flowers? Do, oh do you gosh. do that? Is that, what do you do? Anyway, I, then I called my mum. She's like, go and take a bottle of wine. So I took a bottle of wine. Anyway, so we had dinner and it was a pleasant conversation. And then uh, she made a move on me. Oh my gosh. And I was terrified, <laughs> literally terrified. And after she made a move, I did a rudder and got out of there quickly. And um, that was my first sale. So my first sale came with this trauma. Oh, <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> I, I'm stealing avocados at 11 years old and you're having women hit on you. There's never been a woman who's ever hit on me in my life. The first girl I ever kissed, I married. That is, what a life. I never told that story. That is great. Nobody, no, you guys don't know that story, do you? I've never told that <laughs> story. Great. Our God. first deal. That's Much it. different deal. Yeah. And then it went, then it went, it went on. But I, I, I mean, you say you're not nostalgic, but for me, I look back at those days doing that kind of stuff. And I used to laugh a lot, you oh. know, I used, to, I used to laugh a lot. I mean, we used to have this one way of prospecting for clients and it was called binning. All right. And Bing. so the job every day was to go and go to each company that we went to to collect a compliment slip with the name of the office manager on and what office equipment they had. Right. We'd take those 100 compliment slips, go back to the office and cold call them all. Yeah. That was the job. And then one day someone said, have you tried binning? And I'm like, what's binning? They're like, go and steal your competitor's rubbish. <laughs> ah, Benny, I love it. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, go get their rubbish. The bags go out after work. I okay, go about seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the evening before the trash men come, take their rubbish. In their rubbish, there'll be quotes that they would have done on the word processor that would have been, they'll have mistakes on and they'll have scrunched them up and put them in the bin. Oh my gosh. And I was like, okay, fine, we'll try it. You know, I'm 19 years old, I'm going to try it, yeah? And we, we went and we stole the rubbish of our two biggest competitors. This is awesome. And then we, we got back to the office the next morning and we put the overalls on and the marigold gloves and we'd open the bags up and we'd take the, the tea bags out and that kind of stuff, the coffee cups out. And then there were these quotations that had been scrunched up. And it was like... That's gold. Yeah, absolute gold. You know, a company's <laughs> like gold. So we know what they're quoting. Oh okay. We God. know who they're quoting. Okay. And then it was just a case of getting in touch with those companies. And some of the biggest deals I ever did in those days were from the bins. Binning is great. Look at <laughs> that. But that's business. And I try to tell kids this. And yeah, I don't know what's going to go on with a lot of these kids. But if you can't make money now, I give up. I give up because this is the this... easiest time ever. Oh, man. You think about it. Oh, my. I'm laughing. And it's so great because, I mean, L.A. gets knocked for a lot of things, but we got a heavy Hispanic population that works, and they work hard. So when you talk to these kids about making money, they don't care about politics. They don't care about – they want to make money. And everyone can tell, oh, that's e – no, it's not evil. These kids want to be rich. I, I've mentored many, many athletes and many kids, and I've just found everybody wants the same thing. Uh -huh. They want money. They want to make money. And if they don't, that's fine. And you know, you, like I always say, everyone, you can, you can go with me to Mastro's and we'll get an Uber, or you can drive me. And you can be my Uber driver, it's up to you. And you, know, you hear kids, well, I don't wanna make money. That's fine, well, don't get in business, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you wanna make money, you gotta be in business and you gotta do binning. You gotta do <laughs> avocado, you gotta, I mean, not to be dishonest, but it's, it's competition. It's just everything, it really is, it's competitive. And that's what I, I think more than anything, I enjoy. 
any, most of it was the, the winning. One of our, com our competitors called themselves Carrera, as in the Porsche, yeah? And we never knew why they would call themselves Carrera. But when you went to a lot of the offices in London, you used to have to press the buzzer before they'd let you in. And so they would press the buzzer and they'd say, courier. And then <laughs> couriers always got let in. And so the couriers were let into the office. And then they'd turn up and they're like, yeah, no, courier. I didn't say courier, I said Carrera. That is great. <laughs> it is. And it just so many things when you sit with kids, you know, and they're amazed that you did that. I said, yeah, I'd follow up on any occasion, any reason. When I was collecting millionaires, any reason. Anything to meet him. Oh, wait, wait, you're going to be in Hawthorne? I'm going to be in Hawthorne. I wasn't in Hawthorne. <laughs> I'm two hours away from Hawthorne. What time are you going to be there? 1130. It's like 1015. I'll be there 1145. And be, I mean, I would just to meet him. Just to meet him. Yeah. And kind of like Ken, who we're talking about, who put us together. There was something so neat about success. Just it fascinated me. Like, how did you make a living? You started bidding. Your first thing you hit. It, it's fat. It really is. To me, that's fascinating. Like, and when you talk to these people who've made the money, they all did the bending. They all were hit on by the one. They, they all had these stories. When you hear individually, that to me is fascinating. I don't want to hear about a guy can kick a soccer ball or make a basket. Great. That's fantastic for you. But I, I'm more fascinated by the guy who started out with nothing and started McDonald's or the guy who started out with nothing and started Disneyland and just the stuff they did and the punches they took. Nobody in business ever, ever stumbles upon success, do they? <laughs> no, you God. Know, I think a lot of the world think that, you know, really successful people have stumbled in oh. some way, you know. They've lucked out or some, something's <laughs> happened that's just, you know, oh, guess what, you know what. But it's not, you know, you, you'll, you'll know this. It's, there's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of hours, there's a lot of energy. Uh, of course, it's all fun and we love doing it. But when, when we're younger and um, and kind of fill our lives with that kind of stuff. But it's you th if you're not doing it, you're thinking about it constantly, oh, constantly as well. You're, 24 hours, it, yeah. All the time. Talk to me about your first success in business. What was your first business success? So um, my first real success, we uh, took over a company. It was called Wilshire Coin. The guy was uh, letting me work there and learning about memorabilia. We were selling baseball cards, football cards, any cards, because they're pretty easy to sell. You could buy them over the counter real easy if you bought a, let's say, you know, we'll make it generic, a Mickey Mantle card for $100. You could get it over the counter and say, well, the corner's a little off. I'll give you 60 And that day you could serve, sell it for 220 immediately because I had a market. So I was trying to learn that market. And the guy doing the gold and silver had done everything wrong. He partied, he just blew all his money. And so I started taking my profits and investing in his coin shop. And it was called Wilshire Coin, gold and silver, the largest seller of gold and silver. He had zero money and he didn't really care if people brought over the gold and he'd pay him in a check that wasn't always good. And I kept watching him like, you have good clients and you're kind of blowing it. And one day he looks at me, he was into me for about $40,000. And at the time, I was probably 19. I didn't have 40000 to loan this guy. And so one day he looks at me and goes, I can't pay you the 40. I'm like, what? Like, I, and I'm thinking, you're my friend. He goes, I've taught you everything. Just take the store. He gives me the store. So the deal comes in that day. Guy wants to sell 10 Krugerrands. So I called out to Continental Coin. I'm like, how much do Krugerrands go for? I think it was time, it was like three twenty six dollars each. I'm like... I said, I'll give you 250 bucks. And the guy goes, I don't care. I'll take them. I just want to get rid of them. So I, you know, took a $2,500 thing, went out and made 326. So I'm like, wait a second. I just made like almost $800 in 12 seconds. And so now every time I go, do you buy gold? Do we buy gold? We're the number one buyer. Of gold. I knew nothing. And it was just really trying to learn it on the fly. Nothing. What happens to that business? It's still going. My partner who, who mentored me, Glenn, is still there doing phenomenal. And one of my best friends, it, it was, I ran it for three years and it was great, but we were ready to strangle each other at the end because it's a tough business. And if you walk in, this was before the internet. So you walk in with a hundred Krugerrands and you got to make sure what you know what you're doing when you're going to sell. This is why I do love education is to get information on what you have in your hands. Because a lot of people would walk in like, here, honey, just give me whatever they're worth. And you know, his eyes light up or my eyes lit up. And I remember seeing a time I was making a fortune, but I wasn't, ha I wasn't feeling good about myself because people would come in, you know, a little old lady wants to sell you a diamond ring. And you're like, oh, whatever, I'll give you $800. She's like, okay. And you go sell for $22,000. And like, oh yeah, oh, I'll, every day, every day. Kids, get an education because you will get ripped off. Oh, it was brutal. My wife. 
said to me one wow. day, she'd never talk about your job. I said, our job is to rip off little old ladies. That's not that much fun of a job. And she's like, oh my God, I was wondering why we're making so much money. I'm like, it's not that much fun. I wanted to be a multimillionaire. And at that time we were killing it. So we had a lot of money, but you, know, you didn't feel good about yourself. So then what happened? So then we had a little falling out where I wanted to take his head off with a gun. And in any pawn gold shop, you have a gun every, every step. And he kept pushing me on not working. At the time, I'm 24 years old. And he's pushing me. He was about 35. He had two kids and we're both making a fortune. But my thing making a fortune is like, oh, I'm gonna go out. And I had a couple condos and life is, this is easy. And he kept pushing me. I said, just one more word and I have to kill you. I lost a brother who got shot when I was 12 years old. So I've never really cared about people's feelings. I said, one more word, you're dead. And he knows the story. He tells, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps now. So one more, more one, one more word, you're dead. And I called my wife. I said, you need to get me out of here. We were just engaged at the time. And I said, you need to get me out of here. I said, you can buy me out for whatever you want. Write me a check right now, but I'm out. We can split. And we had like three block loads of gold, silver, memory, a ton of stuff. But you can buy me out or I'll stay, but I'm not coming here. In one hour, we're ending this. And he's like, I'll buy you out. And so he gave me a check, which was very nice, very more than I ever thought I'd get. Oh, oh I'm a terrible negotiator. And when he said the check, I'm like, really? And so we're walking out and it took about three days to clear everything out, I'm walking out with my wife. And he looks at me, and, which was a big help to me. He goes, you'll be back here in six months getting a job for me. And I look at my wife and my wife's like the most beautiful little Asian girl. And she goes, you didn't need to say that to him. And I couldn't believe she got, and I'm now I'm like, look, I said, honey, we don't win, but let's, I already reacted like wanting to kill somebody. Let's, let's win. So we went and started this company called Westside Rentals. And I absolutely went crazy trying to find apartments for every person in LA. So how did that, was that an, an online business or a rental agent? At the agency? time there wasn't even, yeah, it was a rental agent. There oh. wasn't even online. Okay. In fact, the reason we found the internet, this crazy, this is why you listen to everybody. There's genius in everybody. This little kid kept saying, if you want, Mr. Verge, you can set up a website and they'll sign up online with a credit card. Like, shut up. Dude, would you stop? They're not going to sign up with a credit card. Well, if you want, I'll set it up for you. I'm like, do it. Next morning I come in, we had seven sales. When I woke up, I'm like, Wait, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, you did $420, sales, $420 in sales last night. It was $60 a piece, seven sales. I remember that story. I'm like, people put their credit card? It, I couldn't believe it. So then I'm running. We had a staff of like 60 at the time. Make sure you send them to the internet. Send them to put their credit card. I was amazed. A amazed. It was like, <laughs> that, that was a happy day. <laughs> You're right. I am nostalgic right now. When you think about those moments, those kind of like, those, it's like, how did that happen? How did, well, you used to have to print out a list and you have to walk in the person and sell them the list. And now the internet, they're like, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> and then you're going, waking up, you got 300 sales in the morning. Like, that's $18,000. I like this. So, so this is basically a letting agency that you set up. We, we okay. went in and we, at the beginning, it was a toll road business. So what you, is, what you, have an, you have an apartment building, you own it. I say, I'm going to get you the best tenant in LA. Just give me your listing. You put in your one bedroom apartment, I'm gonna get you the best tenant. Now that's not always true, but I'm gonna get you the best tenant. And so I would go to everyone going, I'm the only one who has his apartment. I'm the only one you're gonna get it through. So 300 people would try to get it. And I had, you know, 20,000 listings. So people, I had everything. So your, your, your hustle was being able to go out there and get those listings from those landlords. And it was free. So my okay. owners loved me. Talk about over delivering, I do them free credit checks, free photos. So if you had an apartment, and they used to do it in the newspaper. My goal was to put every newspaper out of business. Out of, you'd pay $300 a week, $300, it was crazy. I think it was like 220 a day to run your ad in a newspaper. Yeah. Which means you had every guy who might be using the bathroom on the sidewalk calling you for your apartment. Yeah. Well, you don't want the guy using the restroom on yours. My thing got people who were seriously looking for apartments, houses, guest houses, and you didn't have to get 500 phone calls. You got five interested people. So owners love me. And the, the tenant was the person that would pay the fee, pay. Not, not, not the landlord. Not the, I, the landlord, okay. they could kick me in the teeth. So they're like, fill your boots, take, take the property. Oh, I mean, I was there, I, I don't know, sure if I'm allowed to cuss on the show. Go for it. I was the biggest ass kisser in LA, by far. <laughs> People said, I'd be interviewing this. What do you do? I say, kiss ass of every owner, whatever they want. Literally, if a tenant was bad, we were like the mafia. If a tenant was bad to my owner, I'd be like, listen, I'm gonna get you evicted and then we're coming after you. We're, I mean, personally, because I had to take care of that owner because mm -hmm. that owner knew I had to put a good tenant in that building. And the tenant, I'd say, listen, I'm getting you this place. You have, and it was great. 
later on, I just found out the the owners were crazy. The tenants were pretty good people. It was so <laughs> funny because I'd be always just going off on the tenant, like make sure when you go in there, you're not allowed. And the tenants would hold up their end of the bargain. Sometimes the owners would raise the rent, and then I'm like, oh my god. And so the tenant would call me like, dude, I'm trying, I'm paying my rent, but this owner is insane. I'm like, so it was great business. And so how long did you have that business for? I had it probably started in 95 and sold it in 2017. And okay, so 12 years. 22 years. I love it. Oh, just so teach you math over there. Sorry, don't yeah, you? No, I'm don't. kidding. We got calculators. <laughs> no, 2005, 17. 1995 and to 1995. Sorry. Ooh, and so, it. yeah, that was the beginning of the internet, wasn't it? 95. First time ever I felt I am smarter than a Brit. That's the first time ever. And I lived in Guilford for six months. <laughs> you lived for, in Guilford? <laughs> yes, Guilford. We so, snuck okay. on and played in, basketball in, and water polo at the University of okay. Surrey. So don't don't ever say that again out loud. I'll Is, teach you what to really, say, okay? okay? I lived in Guilford. No, people don't like Guilford. I lived in Surrey for six oh, months. Oh, really? They don't like Guilford? Surrey's posh. Oh. Okay, so just say, I lived in Surrey for six months. It's like, oh, he lived in Surrey, okay. <laughs> I live in Santa Monica, so we don't even know what posh is. We can even spell <laughs> posh. Okay, so you built this business. It started offline, became online. You were the guy out there. You obviously had competition, so you were out there, you know, trying to get those landlords before everybody else could. Right, and you always had competition. I Did you work in that business through those 95 to 2017? To about 2012 when I got the chance to take over the racetrack, and then I gave it all, I kept 95%, but I gave it to a guy who ran it and made it even better. But uh, I ran it until 2012. And, and, when then, you, and when you sold it? 2017. He's the one who brought in CoStar. What did you sell it for? Not enough. But Rob, we did give, me rough, give me rough numbers. Uh, over a big millions over a good number. I'm happy with it. I never meant it. Millions never, over a good number. Shut up. Just give uh, me what, a rough number. Uh, the, the audience will want what, to know. Give me a number between what and what. What do is you it, want is it between? Is it between zero and 10, between 10 and 100? Above 10, above 10, yeah. above 20. Above 10, above 20, below yeah. 30. There you're close enough. So, okay, we'll give you okay, so, okay, late 20s. Okay, so, uh, and is that, is, that, is that the first first time you, and was it one payment into your bank yeah, account? Yeah, it was yeah. amazing. The guy who owns CoStar, he owns LoopNet, CoStar, now Westside Rentals. Um, I think he's like an $11 billion company called Apartments.com. He came to me. He had never been to Santa Monica, loved it. And he said, listen, if your numbers are right, I said, oh, my numbers are right. My wife's a CPA. She's the smartest person except for Mary and me you'll ever meet. And that was a joke. Somebody laugh here. That was like a funny joke. <laughs> Finally. That's, that's a dad joke. That's ah, a really bad great. dad joke. So <laughs> she, the numbers were right. He goes, you're going to get the wire in your account in 30 days. I'm like, oh, there's no way. And he calls me and says, the, the, the wire, the numbers were right. And the wire's going to be in there tomorrow. I see, he goes, I look forward to seeing you again, da, da, da. And he's like, keep my cell. And great. Lose a cell, of course. Never heard from again. Paid me great. And it just Andy Florence is like my favorite person ever. So how did it feel having that money in the account? Okay. What did it feel we, like? We had a bunch of other stuff going. It really didn't change me. It didn't, didn't change. Okay. No, we, we had done a lot of real estate. We had bought a lot of apartments, hotels. You know, we had a lot of stuff going. It, I, it was good, though. We got to buy a beach house in Santa Monica. She literally was so nice. I wanted to buy a beach house. Always, because we grew up. I was a lifeguard at the beach, Baywatch, as you can tell. Taking a look yeah, at you me. Look yeah, you look yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> An old Should, pale just, Baywatch. Just, I'll call you Mitch for the rest yeah. of the yeah. I, That guy who created Baywatch was an L.A. County lifeguard with me. Isn't that crazy? Really? Yes, Greg Bonin. Sold that for $400 million. Oh, wow. But so when we, we do it, we bought a beach house in Santa Monica Beach, which I love. That, to me, that was pretty cool. We just took that money, and she's like, "We should, if you want, just buy the beach house. I'm like, seriously? So we bought a beach house, and that's always been cool. We don't stay there, but it's fun to have. So this money hits your bank account. You've gone out and you've bought this lovely beach house, but you've had other business interests along the years. So you haven't been solely focused on the one business. You've right. got your fingers in other pies. And your fingers in, and, and were you able to make all of those business opportunities as successful? Or do you think that it's more challenging for an entrepreneur to have fingers in lots of pies rather than laser focus? Yeah, you've got to be laser focus. It really has. We have hotels, restaurants, everything. The laser focus works. When I was laser focused at West, I was great. When I went to run the racetrack, I went to run Santa Anita. I gave my partner, Kevin, uh, 5% of the business, and he took it to another level. When I got fired at Santa Anita, I went back there because my wife got tired of me napping. She goes, you got to do something. So I go back to Westside Rentals, and Kevin, it was our apartment finding service, which was huge. We had eight offices at the time. He says to me, Kevin Miller said, Mark, 
All you do is read the racing form when you come in. We're up 33% without you. He's like, dude, you have enough stuff to do. You have restaurants. You have to do all that stuff. He goes, don't bother me. And then next thing you know, he, get, he gets the call to sell the company. They called him and said, we see what you're doing. And he, great entrepreneur. Okay. Laser focus is key, though. He, don't, try to, don't try to do two businesses. Do one. That's it. Do one. Do it well. Do beyond belief. Yeah. I mean, we all know these guys. When they try to do everything, it's like the athletes out here when they want to be actors or musicians. Like, come on. Stick with, you know. Stick with what Catching the football at. or kicking the football. So that was 2017. You've, you've got this passion for racehorses and everything racing all the way through those years, though. Yeah, you've always been into the horses. And you bought a race course. Several. You we bought... always do it. We always buy racehorses. No, but do you, you bought a racetrack as well? No, I was a CEO of Santa Anita. Okay, so you didn't buy the racetrack, but you've been buying and selling racehorses. Now, there's, there's a community of people in the UK and in Ireland and whatnot that are like big into this stuff you know i live in the uae dubai we have sheikh maktoum and obviously he's crazy about oh, horse racing and there's there's it's kind of like a secret community almost of people that are that are in it rather than people that are out of it you know people you know my dad my dad was or would always go to the big horse races in the uk my uncle jeff would have every single horse on his laptop form the lot <laughs> of you know course. and then we went to the we went to the 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 epsom derby no, we didn't go. It wasn't the Epsom Derby. It was, two, it, it was the 2000 Guineas. And my dad and my mum and my wife and I and my uncle and my auntie went. And it was a, a day at the races. I'm, I'm not really into horse racing, but it was a day out, lots of champagne. So I, I, I'm in, yeah. <laughs> and so we go to the races and we get the form. And my, my uncle Jeff and my dad are studying it through. And my dad's like, this is the horse you want. This horse on this race, this horse on that race. My uncle's like, that one on that race. Do an each way on that one just in case and so on, yeah. And my mum's looking at it and she's drinking away. And she's like, I don't like the name of those horses. And the first horse she chooses, okay, is a horse called Entrepreneur. I love okay? it. Okay. It's 16 to 1. And my dad's like, this, this, that, the, 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 the jockey's an idiot. And he, all this kind of right. stuff, yeah? It wins. The best. And so my mum's had 16 to 1. She's had $10 on it, 16 to 1, 10 pounds on. And she's sitting there with the cash. And she, she looks at my dad. He's like, oh, you're lucky. Anyway, the next horse that comes on, we have a friend of us, a friend of ours that's uh, something to do with birds and whatnot, some bird <laughs> trainer, and it, it's Eagle's Nest or something the horse is called. My mum's like, oh, that's the one. And it was like 25 to 1. She bets on it, half of her winnings, and guess what? It comes in. Love it. Every horse that day she won on, six races, six horses she won on. Okay, and she's sitting there talking to my dad like he's an idiot. Uh -huh. He's like, what do you know? You know jack shit about horse racing. Love and he's it. like, you won because of topical tips. That's how you won, because of topical tips. Now, there's many stories of that kind the of best. stuff. And, it, and it's, is it gambling and a good fun day out and good fun experience, or is it, or can it be scientific? It can be scientific for sure. But, just like anything. Those days happen. That's why it's the greatest game. I mean, it really is. Instead of, and people hate this, I'm amazed how many people go and watch other people play sports when you can be a part of it. Your mom was a part of it. She had a rooting interest and won money on it. And I just think it's the ability to me to be cool. Like, I'm amazed how many guys bring their girlfriends to a basketball game or a football game and wear a jersey. It's embarrassing. You can, it's embarrassing. It really is. I, I had people scream at me when I, it's embarrassing. Like, well, the guy wears the jersey of, of a man. Follows. Of a man. But we're, uh, we're in the uh, basketball jersey. It's just yes. uh, anything. It's ridiculous. And you bring your girlfriend there and you think you're cool. Like, go <laughs> and pick horses. And then you go have fun and you do it together and you read the form and maybe entrepreneur wins or maybe. And that's the fun, and it's a great day, and it costs you nothing, and it's so much fun. But meanwhile, your husband's putting on his jersey of the guy who's 20 years younger than you, and it's like, come on, really? I really do. I believe it. it, it it's the greatest game there is, and the horses are magical. I mean, we get a, a bad rap that we don't take care of the horses until you meet these guys who they would, they would literally strangle everyone but that horse. They love the horses. The people they're not too good with, but the horses I, yeah, are— yeah, well, well, I, oh. I mean, especially where we live— they they they're treated better than humans. Oh, for sure. And well, son, they deserve it. Gone, deservedly so. Incredible. They're the best. And so, do you? How often do you go to to the racetrack? Not as much as I used to. I was heavy into it when I kind of had my falling out with Santa Anita. I kind of put that in the back burner and just 
I, I was always not everyday guy. There's a lot of guys who go every day. I'm a but big you go once, once a week, once a week, every week, and never miss. Oh, never once oh, you a go week. Every week. And I love the workouts in the mornings. Mornings are magical. There, you see the horses work out, and that's the secret society where everyone's having you know coffee and talking about the horse, and because they work out, so you get to see the horse work out, so you get an idea. But I feel your dad's pain because I've been through that enough time. Every time I go to the racetrack, I always say to everyone, pick your own horses. Don't ask me because the worst thing I can do is give you a winner because then I have to hear from you the next race. Like, who do you like here? And it's like, but that is a painful thing. Is, is, is horse racing the same as golf though? You know, golfers have like these bucket list golf courses that they want to go and see. They want to go and play golf at, you know, Glen Eagles or wherever it may be, Augusta. Is it the same with horse racing? Do you want to go to some of these Without amazing races? Yeah? yeah, everyone. Kentucky Derby, everyone's on my bucket. I don't know who has it. Who's stupid enough to have a bucket list? I'm so tired. If I hear that again, I'm like, a bucket. What is that? A bucket. Everyone has it. Bucket list. Like, just go do it. Like, okay. the bucket list. <laughs> like, I love the bucket list. Please shoot me when they take me off this earth when I have a bucket list. But, what uh, one haven't you done yet you want to do? Oh, uh, anywhere. Uh, Australia. I haven't been to the Melbourne Cup. I mean, any of that. But it's, I'm just as happy going to Santa Anita. Going to Del if you go to Del Mar, I know you love Dubai. Del Mar is, is right on par. I mean, it is magical. Magical. And, they have, and do, do, do you like the on the flats or over the jumps? Oh, flats. No, just, yeah, flats. So not like the Grand National where no. they're, they're all committing Harry Carey going no. over these magic I don't magic know how jumps. they do it. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Those jockeys are such talented athletes. They're are just they? am amazing. Frankie DeTore is coming to Santa Anita. He's, he's the god. Every woman, you think Brad Pitt has charm. This guy puts Brad Pitt to shame. Yeah. Well, Frankie lives in the UK. We he's, know him well. He's coming to Santa Anita this year. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to business because you can see your eyes light up when we talk about horses. What happened then? You sell this business, and so you, you've gone back in, and they're like, can you go away and leave us alone? Yeah. Okay, so that, no, you go back in, and then the business is sold. Was there a period where you sat there not knowing what to do with your future? Yeah, it's been, you... that's been for a while, you know, just figuring out next steps. And I like mentorship. I'm doing a lot of mentoring everybody. I'm a very just uh, maybe every day to get someone better. We're, we're dealing in... You know, we're in the United States where everyone's upset about everything every day. So I try to get around uh, just trying to spread the happiness. Everything I do is pretty – I stay around positive people. But what are you, what's your interest now? I mean, then they, you've, you've built another business, no? Nah, just trying. You know, we have several restaurants. We have some hotels, but more just a lot of mentorship. You, you can't play that down. I don't – I really don't – You can't I'm play not that, that into that. I, I, my thing is really – uh, and I, well, I really enjoyed this meeting new There's people. an audience of you guys that are watching this on YouTube and whatnot, and the guys that are listening, it's like, yeah, you know, we've got some hotels and stuff. For a lot of people, that's, that, it that, is, that's it is like good, a... But I've made it. Like, I get it. It's, my jo it's a joke. My life's a joke. I go swim in a cold pool in the morning. Like, I, I don't have... If you haven't made it by 55 years old, I don't want to hear your business idea. Like, get working. In the 20s, you need to work, and you need to crush people. You, 20s and 30s. But the guy who comes up to me, no offense, you 52 years old, let's think we, you and I say, hey, let's start a business. I'd laugh at both of us. We don't, we don't have it. We're not going to go binning. We're not going to go binning. You know, and, yeah, and it, it just, it just I, I really think these kids got, this is the time. I mean, do it do you, now. You think, we're, well, you think we're too old. How old are you? We're up 55. We're done. How old are you? 55. Done. So, so we're three years difference. We're done. We're done. We can't crack like we used to. We can't go binning. You know we can't go <laughs> binning. And, but and I would have gone binning. But now it's got, we got homes everywhere. It's like, what, what are you going to do? Like, how much, you know, I want to slap the shit out of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Now they're flying to the moon. Like, wrap it up. Guys, wrap it up. <laughs> no, really. I don't care what you say. I really don't. Like these guys talk like I want to just punch them in the face. I'm doing a plant-based business, and the only reason I want to do it to make it successful is so I can either slap Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. That's the only reason I want to make more money because these guys are so obnoxious. If I have to hear about you going to the moon and saying, you know, the earth is going to be like a, you know, a vacation spot, it's like stop. There's guys who are grinding every day, who are working, who want to be successful, who have not been as fortunate as you, Jeff, or Elon. You got to stop. I mean, it's really just Trump well, and then they get obnoxious. Who do you admire? Wow. Who do I admire? I just friends. I, I have, you know, wife, two kids and four friends. That's it. I and ad admiration. I always think if, if, if I want to meet a celebrity who I'd really, it'd be Michael Jordan. I try to remind myself every morning to treat everyone I meet like I'm meeting Michael Jordan. 
I went to Chicago one time and a, a buddy of mine owns the largest steakhouse in Chicago. So I'm going to just watch him work. It's, it's amazing. It's watching, you know, Roger Daltrey play. It's like, Oh my God, you're amazing. So fly out there. And I said to myself, whoever I meet, I'm a treat like Michael Jordan, whoever it is. Cause I just was fascinated. Like maybe I'll meet Michael Jordan. He's always in the steakhouse. Stewardess comes up and do you need, no, no, I don't need anything. By the end of the flight, she's like, here, anytime you need anything, first class, anything, here's cookies for you. I'm like leaving with like an American Airlines bag. I get to the rental car company. Lady, I meet Michael Jordan, said to her, whatever you need. And she's like, where are you from? I'm in LA, but it's so nice to meet you. What's your story? Find out. She's like, I'm allowed to do this once a month at Hertz. I can pick any car on the lot. Take it. I'm like, oh my God, this meeting, meeting Michael Jordan is working out. Then I stayed at some big resort, whatever. It was a Trump building in Chicago. It got, they gave me, the, I mean, everyone treating people nice is magical. And I think we forget that. So my admire celebrity meet would be Michael Jordan, but admire is just my wife, two kids, and my four to 12 friends I have. When you, when you look at young people today that are going into this kind of entrepreneurial space after going through the education system like they have, what, what ingredients do you think they need or what do you think they need to learn that they don't already know uh, uh, that, that seems to be missing over and over again for them to get out and be successful? Nobody cares about you. You got to shut up and listen. And once you shut up and listen and ask leading questions, people will open up to you. But when you come in and tell me about your idea, I literally want to punch you in the face because I've had the most successful people in front of me. I don't need to hear about what you're going to do, just do it. I believe, believe with my eyes. I'm done with my ears. So when I, and I'm tough on my kids, I mentor. I think it can be done. You just have to go all in. You have to listen and network. Network like crazy. And network isn't meaning, oh, I wanna, you, 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 you gotta meet everyone in the room and treat them the same, the valet guy. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into parties where I'm walking in, someone will trip or you open something up and that's the person who's the guest speaker. Just because you're freaking nice and it's, it should be easy, but that's gone now because now it's like, who did you vote for? Well, yeah, do you like, you know, fish or do you eat meat? Like we're so opinionated and we're so, not me and not us, but so many people, unfortunately, in my part of California are very opinionated. It really matters like who you voted for or what you wear or what you eat or what you don't eat or what smoking. I like, I grew up in a city of Santa Monica, it's supposed to be free speech, free this. You came and smoke. Like, what are you talking about? Like. I, you can't smoke on the street and like, and it's, it's gone crazy. It's gone absolutely crazy where, you know, you just let people live, just enjoy and be nice. And if you're into business and you want to make money, you got to make money from everyone and don't get into this political battle or don't get into, you know, being nice to the rich guy in the room or the Jeff Bezos of the room, be nice to everyone around the room. And if you meet Jeff Bezos, God bless you, be nice to him. But I think these kids, don't understand how much people who are successful successful want to meet them. And that's why I try to tell them, you have one thing, youth and energy and hunger, and they want to help, but you got to make sure they like you. I used to always teach about mentorship. Make sure who you're trying to get to likes you because that will help. Really valuable. They, they, the attitude, when I compare the UK or London to the UAE where I live in Dubai, I feel that people living in Dubai seem to have a far more... Um, positive, optimistic mindset. They came to Dubai because they wanted to make uh, uh, their fu their fortune, their success, their career. A little bit like, you know, the gold rush was many years ago here. It feels like a modern day version of the gold rush. I go to the UK and I find everyone so negative and so cynical and so, so, so I'm a realist. I hate it when people say that, <laughs> you know, and, it, but when you look at it, arguably, when you look at it, there are, at least as many, and I would probably say 10 times more opportunities in London than there are in near, nearly every place in the world, if you compare it to Dubai, because London's 10 million people, you know, the whole country of the UAE is not even 10 million people. There's a lot of old money there. There's a lot of business brains that are there. You've got all that going there. So is it about the location that you live in or is there equal opportunity everywhere for the person that's got the hustle and the desire to get out there and make it happen? I would think definitely equal opportunity. I do think there's an advantage when you're around more people like LA or London. So I'm shocked they're so negative, but it doesn't surprise me because conversation now is all about politics or look at this guy who's making too jealousy. And to me, 
I want to be that rich guy. And these kids do too. And so it is a shame that, you know, they're getting taught too many things of, you know, you're not going to make it or it's not that much fun when you do. Or look at this poor guy who's made all this money. He's terrible. It's like, I don't know. I think money solves a lot of problems. And I think if you want that, that's great. And if you don't, that's great too. The happiest guy I know is a UPS driver. He's the happiest guy I know. God bless him. And I think that's great. But if you want to get in business, you've got to lose a negative. No one who wants to be around negative. And I find it with kids all the time. You know, I believe the obstacles away. This Ryan Holiday book, it's amazing. You got to run into obstacles and you're going to get punched in the face. And business, as we both know, binning is not fun. Business is not fun. Well, it, it is when you're 19, but not any other age. God, I, I don't even, I mean, I just, it binning is at 19 not fun. It's like, you know, <laughs> look back, it is. But when you're in business, you're getting punched in the face daily. Mm-hmm. I tell people you're in business when you're on your fifth lawsuit and your, your partner in the business is stolen from you. That's it. Your partnership. I was telling part are you crazy? It's like you you maybe every time I'm t- teaching business school, I look up and they say, Oh, we're gonna be partners. I'm like, you're never gonna be friends again. Because it's gnarly. But when they feed into the negative, I think it's just kind of like why people protest so much. Everyone protests everything here because no one wants to look up and say, Well, I'm not doing a thing. I'm living at home with my mom and dad, but I'm gonna protest because I don't want Trump in the White House. So it's like, well, who are you protesting to? You're in LA. Everyone agrees with you. They go down and protest and they stop everything. I, I, I was laughing. My, you know, my family, we don't get into politics. My daughter and wife and I and son, they're like, should we go to the protest? I'm like, but we're protesting the same people. Like, okay, people are mad, whatever. I'd even vote. And everyone else is going, I agree. I agree. What are you going to say? It's, it's the dumbest thing ever. But I think it's a form of just don't look at me. And it, don't look that I'm not successful because I do think, you know, you look at these kids, they watch Kardashians out of control. They want this thing, but maybe they're afraid to admit they can't get that thing because that takes hard work. I mean, it's, it's hard work wins. Last question for you. For the young people that are watching this right now, okay, if they want to become really successful, give, give us three tips wow. that they need to follow, what they need to do. Yeah, this is, sounds terrible if we're talking about binning and stealing stolen <laughs> Yeah, avocados. go binning. Yeah, number one. Number God, if you can keep your integrity, it really does. I learned that, you know, when I got in the gold and silver business, because there was a lot of times that you could jerk people when you're selling to them. And you, that probably was one of the things I regret most is I would have loved to be back with more integrity on the buy side. So if you can go into this with the integrity, loving yourself, I tell these kids, they don't love themselves. Like, I'm, I love my, there's nothing better than me driving alone to Del Mar today. Like, listen to my own music. Like, I would love them to love that person in the mirror. Because once you do that, you can solve everything. So I, I would just say, don't, just love, love yourself, integrity, and outwork everybody. You really, but you gotta, you gotta want it. Don't, don't do it for your parents. Don't do anything for anything but yourself. Because these kids, so many times, they don't realize, like, if you want to be successful, and your parents are running a big shop and you just want to make money, well, go work for your parents. Don't try to do it on your own. Like, I meet more kids whose parents are very successful. I'm like, what do you want to do? I, I want to make money. Well, that person's been <laughs> setting it up. Oh, I, I never want to do what he does because I want to start my own thing. It's like, well. So let's just summarize that then. So love yourself. Love yourself. Okay. Number two, have let's integrity. Integrity. Okay. Number three, outwork everyone. I think so. Yeah. It's got to be that one, doesn't it? Yeah, you have to. You have to. You I have agree. to outwork. Awesome. But also, but make sure you want it. Like, it's, it's not the answer for all of us. Like, I meet these kids who want to make money for what reason, I don't know. You might be just as happy being a UPS driver. Guy, I met a kid the other day who wants to work for me. He's fascinated with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He loves the uh, L.A. Lakers. He loved the Boston Red Sox. He loves golf. And he lives in an apartment. I said, you're never going to be rich. You can't go watch a game. I didn't watch a game for two hours. That, that's out. That's absolutely out. You got to work. There's, you don't get to sit back at the bar. I never had a drink till I was 27. I've never done a drug. There's no sitting around. You're thinking about this business 24 hours a day. And make sure you want that. Don't say you want It's like working out. You know? mm-hmm. it's, uh, what does it say? Easy, easy to run a mile, easier not to. It's that whole kind of like the romance associated with it. It's the romance of the, the, of the outcome. You know, it's interesting. I've been in the investment business for many years. And... All of the people that, not all, many of the people I meet don't actually really care about where the money's invested. What they care about is the outcome. 
So I give you a hundred bucks. You're going to give me a hundred and ten bucks back in a year. Is that correct? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, but let me explain where the money's going to go and what we're going to do with it. You know, you know. Let me talk to you about derivatives. Let me talk to you about you know mutual funds or whatever it might be. And invariably, most people are sat there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. They pretend to be interested, but really, it's the outcome that they're looking for. And then you compare that to. I don't know, people with diets and losing weight. It's like they want the outcome, okay? They don't want the bit in the middle. They want the outcome. And I think that's with success in business. It's like you want the outcome, but be very clear on what you've got to do to get that outcome. Be very clear on, on the work that's going to have to go in to get to that place. And if you're not clear on that, then invariably the outcome will never happen. Will never happen, ever. And don't even do it. Thank okay. you so much for coming to join us on the podcast. The best. You're stuck with me now. I'm moving to the UAE. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Thank you. It. Thank you, guys. Oh.